What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. Where are we at at this point? Like, how many, how long after this the This is crash? like um, 20, I want to say end of 2016. Oh, so, okay, a wow. while. It's a couple yeah. years later. Yeah, it took yeah. them a while. It takes a long time to search a seabed like this. Yeah. Look, one thing I want to make clear is I, I have been sort of critical and, and, and skeptical, but the, what they did was amazing. It was an amazing feat of um, just technological bravado and in, in, in searching an area that's three miles deep. Like that's incredible. Yes. And it was a thousand miles from the nearest port. I mean, it was really difficult. I would not want to be in these guys' shoes, like terrible rough seas, everything. So what they did was heroic, hats off to them. It didn't succeed. And now we need to figure out why it didn't succeed. They said, it must be north of the area we searched, but we don't have any money, so we're gonna stop. And so they did. And they sort of said, case closed. Then this company comes along that nobody knows who they are. They're called Ocean Infinity. And they say, we are going to search this area and you only have to pay us if we find it. And we have this new generation of technology. We have these fleet of robot subs that all kind of work together. Bounty and everybody's... hunters, basically. Well, actually, Business Week just had a, um, a really long article about this outfit uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, they were they were treasure hunters. Hmm. They had they had invested all of this money. So one of these tax write off kind of things where like rich guys like want to like <laughs> it's it was all really shady. It always is. And like and the archaeologists were like, you're destroying the wrecks, and you're like, no, we're just taking the gold bars, you know. So they basically developed this technology so they could go around the world and look for wrecks. So they're they're like, we're gonna find. So they're they're thinking, well, okay, we're gonna we want to scan the seabed and find some nice juicy wrecks. But we're also going to like get the Malaysians to pay for it if we find the plane. Mm. Um, so they volunteered. They said we're going to search this other, and they they searched like another whole area, the same size. They did it much faster because their technology was better. But they searched the area where the Australian officials had said we know it's in this other area, but we don't have enough money to search for it. Mm. It wasn't there either. So these guys, you know, you've got this kind of shrinking probability distribution. They keep on searching where they know it is and, and that area not. gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. And so the question then becomes like, okay, well, where, is it there or not? Is it there or not? Because you said very confidently in that tone that you, I think very accurately uh, identified a sort of male overconfidence, yes. um, white male overconfidence, we can say, <laughs> um, you know, uh, so where is it? It's not there. Now, to get on your timeline with all of this, though, okay. you ended up through your blog posting and obviously reporting on all the channels, right? basically everywhere on, on this case, you ended up at the forefront of this thing called the independent group. Yes, right. And when did that, when did, so that's basically like a, I'll have you explain the full thing to people, but okay. it's basically like a, like a public crowd campaign to try to solve this case with people, random people around the world who have sometimes expertise, sometimes just like trying to solve it, right. coming together with whatever whatever information they can pull to find this plane. Right. When did that first start? That started in the first few weeks after, well, the when the, um, the search officials let it be known that they had this Inmarsat data and that the Inmarsat data said certain things. It had this, we were talking earlier about what does this data mean? Um, a lot of people who care deeply about the case were like, wait, what, what are you talking about? Like, how can you tell these things that you say you can tell? And especially the BFO data. And so people were trying to understand what they were talking about. And I had some ideas. I was going on CNN a lot at the time. Um, uh, I was writing about it on my personal blog. Um, I, on air, I would just talk about the stuff that like everyone agreed on and that the, I basically, the, the job of a station like CNN is just to sort of take whatever officials say and sort of restate it, okay? But I was like really interested in what the data meant. Like what could we tell about what was happening? And it was like a little bit too technically arcane for an audience like that. So I was writing about it on my blog and then people would reach out to me, Mike Exner being one of them. And he said, look, this is what this satellite system is. This is where, this is who made it. This is where it's located in the plane. Did you explain off camera or on camera who Mike was? I, I can't remember. Was that right before camera? We were talking about that. Um, so Mike Exner is a um, scientist, engineer uh, who lives in Colorado. 
and he's worked on satellite communication systems for many years. And so he's very well versed in how they work and Got what it. the different parts of it are. So I get this email, or I get a, actually, I think it was a, a comment on my, my blog, I forget which, but this guy reached out to me. And we, I think it's, we, we talk about it also in the, in the, um, the documentary on Netflix. He reaches out to me. He's saying he's laying some technical information on me that's like way above my pay grade. I don't even know what he's talking about, but I reach out to him and he explains who he is and how he knows this stuff. I start emailing with him. There are some other people who are also blogging about this stuff. And we all kind of get this email chain going. It's all very informal. One of the members pipes up and says, we should call ourselves an independent group. <laughs> and they did. And like, so this ran, like literally random group of internet commenters comes mm -hmm. together and forms like, you know, the wonder twins. And, um, and we start trading information, trading ideas, discussing possibilities, trying to work out where the plane could have gone, et cetera. And like these guys, some of them, are, I, some of them I like more than others. Some of them I have more respect for than others, but the best of them have like just a truly phenomenal knowledge of physics and um, engineering and how satellite uh, communication systems work and so forth. So I think we were able to really understand in fairly uh, great detail, what these scientists are talking about and um, and what it means for the plane could be. And these guys um, do wind up developing a quite a close relationship with the search officials. And when the Australians issued their final report, um, which is 2016 or 2017, they get thanked by name. They thank the independent oh, group wow. and they thank some of these individuals like Mike Exner by name. Wow. I should hasten to add, by this point, I've long since been kicked out of the independent party. <laughs> right. So that was, I was kind of teeing that sure, one up sure. because what, what year, before I get into this, what year did you come up with that theory we're going to talk about? Like how long after, after the crash? So I believe it was June of 2014. So about- um, Three months after. June, right. Okay. So Three you, months after the, so finally the uh, the Malaysian government releases the information to explain how we use the BFO data to, gen, to, know, to tell us that the plane went south, okay? As soon as they explain it, I'm talking to Mike and I say, okay, this definitely, okay, I should, let me back up one little step, which is to say that this all seemed very strange to me. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you would do this elaborate set of things and commu commit suicide, it seemed to me more likely that uh, that when we knew that it could go north or south, it seemed to me north. Because if you go north, you get to be alive. You get to stay alive. It's land up there. It's land. And so I said, this plane probably went north. And I said to my editor at Slate, I want to write an article saying that I think the plane went north. And she said, well, nobody else seems to think it went north. I said, okay, listen. I really wanna write this article. If, I, if you let me write it and I'm wrong, I will publicly apologize. She said, okay, you're on. So, when the, so in June, when the uh, officials released their explanation of how the BFO data works, I, I, I rolled up my sleeves, I polished my um, you know, high school math, and I did, I did the calculations and it took me a while because I was very rusty, but I'm like, oh, I get it. It went south. Like they're right. The BFO data means that it went south. Right. That's what so I saying. went to my editor and I said, "Okay, here's your article explaining why I went wrong." And she said, "Okay, this is this." <laughs> so she ran it and she said, "This is an article explaining where you went wrong. This is not actually an apology, which is what you which is what you promised." Oh, so you had already said the theory that you thought it went north to, to Kazakhstan, right? At this point, okay. Uh, I, I think it was so early that we didn't know that it was Kazakhstan. I thought it was like Central Asia. There was a kind of like um, nascent uprising in China involving the Uyghur minority. Yes. Um, Xinjiang. So anyway, I thought it was there. That turned out to be really, really off the, off the map. So at this point, I think it would be clear to anybody that I am wrong sometimes. <laughs> I, I, I am not Thank always you. right, you know? And so- God, sometimes um, <laughs> people are unwilling to say that in here. I am too while okay. we're at it. Well, I, it's important to, to acknowledge your flaws. Um, it's not a flaw. I mean, this is the thing. I wrote this piece. I'm like, listen, I was wrong, but we didn't know as much then as we know now. That's and now fair. we know more. And now I, I see that I was wrong. I was taken. We're, we're trying to do the best with what we have. Yes. So 
But she did make me write a second article explicitly apologizing for, but I, and I still like kind of weaseled out of it by saying, look, I'm not really sorry. I, I was trying, I was doing my best. So anyway. I understand what you um, mean. Yeah. But, okay, so I apologize. <laughs> I have a habit of of saying that I'm wrong, but then like being like, but am I really wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, so in June, I'm like, Mike, how does this BFO data get generated? Like, how does the plane, how does this thing work? Like, let's just like break it down for me because the question I want to know is the BFO data tells us that the plane went south. Is there any way that the BFO data could be generated? Let me put it this way. Is there any way that that data could be tampered with? Could you mess with it? Is there mm. any way that a devious, like let's just say, an, uh, let's, just, let's imagine somebody on this plane of kind of unlimited deviousness and skills and resources and everything. Can we say, like, how does this work? Is there a way that it can be uh, interfered with, right? And I remember like standing, I remember the, the, where I was standing where Mike was explaining to me how this, this, this data is generated and realizing that like, it comes from a part of the plane that anybody mm -hmm. can access. Like there's an unlocked hatch that goes into this thing called the electronics bay. And in the electronics bay, you have all the electronics that control the entire plane. And where would that be on a standard commercial jet? Like I walk in off the, whatever go, that thing yeah. is that connects to the plane and- Take a left. The, okay. Take a left, go into first class. Actually, it was styled as business class on this particular flight. We go up, stay to the left side of the plane, go up to the first toilet. On your right, near the galley, there's going to be a carpet. If you pull up that carpet, there's a hatch. The hatch mm. is not locked. You open it's not it, locked. It's not locked. And if you go open it up and go down in there, you have all of the computers that feed the navigation system, that control the wings and the ailerons and the rudder. Is this locked today now? Um, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think so. I, but, but I should say oh, that- Oh, I'm chucking that shit next time I get on a plane. <laughs> everything, that, everything that I'm gonna describe- Lock that thing up could not happen today. Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.